I set realistic targets. So what's our target? Our target is make quarterfinals. Some of the things that I would have said to players in the past, you know, there's no way that I would be as direct as I as I would have been. Is it proving the old adage that you should never go back? Some people have said that, but I'm not afraid of that. Players throw the toys out the cot. They're not going to be in my squad for too long. You called England bottle jobs. Did I say that? I was a waste of time talking about the Six Nations. The Gats has already said Wales are going to win, and I'm sitting at myself again. Oh my God! Could you not have parts of the the, the, the stands that were integrated? That, families? Well, you're going all woke on us here. <laughs> you've gone woke there, mate. You've been in the studio for too long. You've gone all woke. This is up front with me, Simon Jordan. I believe there are a lot of vacuous, uninformed, unchallenged opinions out there. I want to get to the bottom line and cut through the nonsense. So with this podcast with William Hill, I'm going to get people with strong views who think they can stand them up to proper scrutiny. There's a good chance I might learn something along the way. And more importantly, so might you. Joining me in today's episode, a legendary rugby coach on the international stage, winning multiple Six Nations titles and reaching two World Cup semi-finals. He's also led the British and Irish Lions on three separate occasions. And this September... He'll be taking Wales to the World Cup final. Juan Gatland, welcome to Upfront. Thanks, Simon. Thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your World Cup schedule. One of the things that we do, Warren, in this show from the outset, because it's all it's all about elite people predominantly and how they've got to where they've got to and what made them. So walk me through Warren Gatland and what has been the making or the challenges and the journey that you've been on to be where you are today? I suppose growing up in New Zealand, I came from a, a pretty humble background. Um, my father took me to the local rugby club when I was five years of age. Uh, I didn't really know about football or anything right. like that. It was kind of rugby. Every, just, everyone basically played rugby and cricket. That was kind of like uh, growing up. Uh, you played uh, your rugby in bare feet. You didn't graduate into a pair of rugby boots until you were sort of 10 years of age. Right. And uh, when I got a little bit older, I, I got into cricket and right. played a lot of cricket. I played to a pretty high level in, in rugby and cricket. Wasn't quite sure which way I was going to go. I was going to have a choice. Was I going to go the cricket route and end up going um, the rugby route? What determined that? Just the opportunity, really. It was, had played provincial cricket, playing sort of involved in rugby, and then... You, Sometimes you get that opportunity that comes along, like selected as sort of a uh, with for Waikato as a provincial side and culturally any difference because at this moment in time in England we're having this big debate about some of the challenges of sport and you might have seen recently in cricket this idea of elitism and and classism in sports. Was there any cultural uh, reasons why you alighted upon rugby rather than cricket? No, uh, I, just the opportunity. Yeah, New Zealand's not you know it's I think pretty much sport in New Zealand is is classless. You know, you're just you get taken down to your local club, and it doesn't matter if you come from a you know single parent family or you or your parents are lawyers and doctors. Everyone sort of just mixes. Whether it. you can play or you can't. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's kind of um, been the experience. And I think for me, you know, right from a really early age, I was incredibly competitive. Right. I, I wanted to win. Yeah. It didn't matter what it was. Um, if I was at school and the score was being kept. I wanted to be on the winning side, and if if a teacher wasn't keeping the score or the result, I lost interest pretty quickly. So, right. um, yeah, that, and that I don't know where that came from, but I was I was pretty driven and, and pretty competitive about wanting to be successful. Is there a different makeup to the Southern Hemisphere culture than there is to the Northern Hemisphere in terms of their approach? And I'll tell you why I asked that question because I've had a lot of experience of Antipodeans, and it's been really good experiences and every time I see an Antipodean being indexed to a job or doing a job and having had them work with me and for me I've I've loved the culture I've loved the attitude and the directness of it you know you're from yeah. one hemisphere you're working in another yeah is there any thinking what I'm thinking about the nature of the two different cultures you celebrate success and and it's such a small nation and it doesn't matter whether it's rugby whether it's cricket whether it's football or it's been hockey or anything in the Olympics and we've probably punched massively above our weight um, in, a, in a lot of sports and it's have this sort of maybe never say die attitude. Yeah. Let's just go out and give it a crack yeah. and always believe that something special can happen and mm. don't have any doubts. You know, you can, you're going to get beaten by better players or better teams on the day, but still going on with that sort of... You're going to get beat with your boots on. Yeah. You're yeah. going to give it 100% and, and go on with some confidence that 
you know, something special can, can happen. And I've kind of always had that attitude. I always, I always believe, I always believe that, um, don't have any doubts. I just think that the straightforward mentality of there's no excuses. There's no reason for people to not put their best foot forward. You, you kind of know when you're in a conversation with an Antipodean yeah. because they tend to mean what they say and say what they mean. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think the, probably one of the greatest things is, is, and I talk to often our players, is about how powerful peer pressure is. Yeah. They're not afraid to call their teammates out and yeah. point a finger at them and just say, hey, that's, no, that's not good enough. As a coach, are you... An advocate of that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's the biggest thing. That if, if we can get a leadership group or group of players that that take control, they set the standards, they demand the standards, and and for me as a coach, you know, I, I want to be the last. If I, you know, if I've got to step in, then hopefully that's only the, in a serious situation. I, I'm I'm the I'm the last step, the last line, and in, in terms of that, if we can get the players doing that, then um, that that solve 90, 95% of any issues that you have within a team. And and particularly uh, some of those older experienced players. Actually, I spoke to the players last week in, in terms of them, uh, said, you know, the, the highest paid sports people in the world, uh, the ones who have the longest careers, they have the most caps. There's no coincidence about them who are the most successful. There's no coincidence that they do all the extras. They do the most prehab, the yep. most rehab. They do uh, extras after training. They look after their diet. They watch themselves. They do the stretching. Um, and, and It's the Gary Player mentality, isn't it? Yeah. 100%. You played 17 times for the All Blacks, yeah. but you never played in any test internationals. Yeah. Does that, I mean, obviously, Sean Fitzpatrick is a difficult one to dislodge, right? But does that rankle with you? No, not or at did all. You, or have you used it going forward as a coach? It's been great for me as a coach. It's kind of In what been, way? Um, I always joke when I've asked, been asked, me, I say I was a better player than Sean Fitzpatrick. And, right. and and the reason I say that is because as a coach, I expect my players. The hardest thing is, as a coach is, is selection, because you know that people are going to be disappointed. They they they're going to be upset potentially about the team that's been picked. But I understand that. And I've experienced that sort of uh, that disappointment, but it's then how do you respond to that disappointment? Yep. You know, if, uh, the adversity. Yeah. yeah, and how do you work harder? How do you how do you keep um, knocking on the door? But the last thing that, and I say, if players throw the toys out the cot, a bit in a all yeah. week, they're not going to be in my squad for yeah. too long. So, uh, you know, you've got to put that disappointment behind you, and then then your role and your responsibility for the rest of the week is to do whatever it takes and whatever you can do to help that team prepare for um, for the match on, on the weekend. And so, yeah, in those days, there were, it was only injury replacements. And mm. so you only got on if, if that player got injured yeah. and Sean Fitzpatrick never, never got, got injured. injured yeah. No, um, but I, I kind of look and go, um, I, I'm, I'm so grateful for the experiences that I had being an All Black, you know, playing those games, yep. going on tours, and what I learnt just from really, they were really, really simple life lessons. Were you grateful at the time? Or have you been grateful in retrospect? Oh, I know. I was, I was yeah. grateful at the time. Yeah, I was kind of like, I can remember looking out, out the window, uh, on a, of an All Black bus on tour, and there was, only a thousand people outside, and I just went, looked at, and the first thing I thought is, you know, just don't take this for granted. Mm. Um, appreciate it and like I said those some of the simple things simple life lessons that you learned and my first uh, meeting uh, with an All Blacks uh, team it wasn't with the coaches it was with a group of the whole the whole team of players together where the senior players basically led the meeting and they talked about the responsibility of the jersey yeah the history what it meant um, I remember one of the players saying at a, a, in this meeting, he said, you're better off never being an All Black than to be considered a bad one. And I kind of went, wow. Right. Yeah. And, but, and, but then just the, the things, just the simple life thing. So when the coach said to you, run to the line and back, you ran to the line and back. You didn't stop sh six inches short, or, short. If he said run around the field, you ran around the field. You didn't cut the corner there because the messages were 
if you take a little shortcut at training, what are you going to do on a pitch? Yeah. When it gets tough. Yeah. And for me, they weren't just rugby lessons or sport lessons. They're life lessons. They're, absolutely. Yeah, 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 just cool. simple, just simple things. So that those those things have always stuck, stuck with you, stuck with me, yeah. and about you know working hard. I look back on just how privileged and how lucky I was to have those experiences, mm -hmm. and really. Um, yeah, they've definitely moulded me and helped me and made me a better coach as well. Were you a natural born leader by default, by design? I, I, I think I had a good understanding. I think I got, had a good understanding of people. I think I was, as as a captain, I was was pretty good at motivating people, pushing the right buttons. I've always felt that I've had a good feel about when to go for, for training, you know, when to push players to the limit, when to be able to pull back, you know, when we needed a tough week, when we needed a lighter week, how do you keep them mentally fresh? A good example of that, um, when I was at Wasps uh, and I knew, and we had a number of England boys in our team and Leicester had a lot of England boys in the Leicester team. And the England boys, when um, Clive Woodward was coaching them, uh, they would train at Penny Hill Park, and they would they would train on a Monday and Tuesday, and then when they came back to me, I'd give them Wednesday, and Thursday was our day off. So the first day they would be back into us would be on a Friday. Without me doing anything, the word got around how well our players been looked after. Yeah, they were being kept fresh, the man managed really well, and I kind of just let that kind of feed itself yeah. you know when people start talking about those things right yeah. yeah yeah and it was it wasn't done to to um uh, against any other club i was just i was just doing what i thought was the best for my players that you know how hard they would have trained those first couple of days that they, they needed the wednesday as a recovery and thursday was off you know i was just thinking about us as a team and mm -hmm. how it would benefit and what was the best us. outcome yeah but the the impact or the knock-on effect of what everyone else thought we were doing, yeah, was um, beneficial, significant. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. What what does a leader look like to you, both from from from, from the point of view of your space oh, for me. and for people that play for you? Oh, I want great people around me. Yeah, I do mould people a little bit, but sometimes that moulding takes a little bit of time because I want them to feel. By moulding, what do you mean? Setting their standards and asking them to maintain well, it, no, or, just, or, or adjusting the way they think? Yeah, or just yeah. Sometimes I might they, they might not be quite where I want them to go in terms of some of their coaching and some yeah. of their thought, but that I don't come in, I'm not, I don't come in heavy handed and go, no, I don't, I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to do that. I will subtly have discussions about, have you thought about doing this? Have you thought about that? And I'm not talking about, I'm only talking about just small points. I mean, I'm talking about getting really good people who, who I know are going to be good, but I want them to have ownership. I want them to feel like they're in charge of what they're doing. I'm comfortable being challenged, mm -hmm. and I want them to challenge me. To what me. degree? Oh, whatever. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind to being challenged about any anything, and I, I'm comfortable with players challenging me as well because I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge my coaches, so they should feel comfortable challenging me, and the players should feel comfortable challenging me or disagreeing with me. Uh, I don't know everything about the game, so you know, big players come to me and go, ask me a question, and I go, I don't know the answer to that. What do you think? That in itself, you know, you get a lot of people who think they're the leader. Oh, I, I need to know everything. I need to know mm. the answers for everything. And, and you don't. But as a group, as coaches and, and whatever, we might have strong debate and discussion. We might not always agree on selection. We might not always agree on how things, the way we might want to do things. But it's a robust discussion and mm. debate. But when we've made a decision, we've made it collectively, then we all support but each other. Lead, but there was a leader at the top of it all, wasn't there? Oh, it, it yeah. has to be. Yeah. There has to be kind of like, um, you know, sometimes you've got to make make those hard calls. But I, I find that nearly all of it is we're all, all on the same page with, you know, the having a consensus where we all yeah. believe and buy into it. Your style of leadership, has it changed over the years? Or has it had to change? Because are we looking at, I mean, I suppose the point I'm making is I think society is changing. Oh, and that's... I think what you can and can't say, I think normal rules in sports and society don't apply. I used to have managers that would have very strong words in dressing rooms with players and I had no issue with it 
whatsoever because yeah. ultimately it's the language of the sport. But for you, in the society that we live now with rugby and sport and culture, have you had to change your style? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you just kind of... Are you, we're, are, we're does it such... piss you off you've had to change your style or um, you just say, well, it's evolution? Just in such a woke society now that you've got to be careful mm. with what you say. You know, even even to the point where um, I, I find it, you talk about sport and and the, and the elite sport and the, the people at the top of the game. Doesn't matter what sport. I, I think you've got to have a mental toughness. You've got to be mentally yeah, tough. Yeah, got a resolute. Got and to be that's resolute, kind of like it's resilience. almost at the moment that talking about mental toughness is kind of almost like saying oh, that's a little bit taboo at the mm -hmm. moment when you when you when you challenge. I agree. <laughs> you I, know? I agree, mate. <laughs> and you're going, whoa, you know, hang on, we where where are the where are the lines here? The Even ground? in rugby, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know because, and, and I told you, I'm involved in test match rugby and test match rugby. We talk about why do they call it test match rugby? Because it's a test of everything. It's a yeah. test of your physicality. It's big boy stuff. Yeah, it's yeah. a test about yeah. how tough you are. It's a test of your mental toughness. It's a test, you know, physicality, you know, all of what you're prepared your, to do to be successful. Your, your skills, all those sort. Of, that's why they call it t uh, test match rugby. So. Yeah, it's you know definitely the language has changed. You've got to be careful. I mean, some of the things that I would have said to players in the past, um, you know, there's no way that I would be as direct as I as I would have been in terms of giving it to someone right between the eyes with some of the language. Do you think something's been lost as a result of that? Possibly, yeah, yeah. I, I can remember uh, saying something to a player in a, in a change rooms where uh, others other players thought I was I was completely over the top where. I told him what I th thought of him, what other people had thought of him, uh, that he wasn't positive in the environment. And I know players were a little bit shocked by that. Um, but for me, the biggest thing about that was that player came and saw me. He saw me two years later and he said, you know what you said to me in the change room? He said, I said, yeah, he said, it's the best thing that ever happened yeah. to me. He said, it made me look at myself yep. and what other people thought. Concentrate in my mind. Yeah. And kind of, I'm not sure that we, that we're always getting the directness or those some of those life lessons. Life's tough. I think it's coming back around again, though. Yeah, you think, I think so? We've had, I think we've had two or three years of nonsense, where and the, you know the the, the 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 phrase of the moment is wokeism. I, mean, yeah. I think it's a, a certain mindset that needs to be balanced out against the reality of life and the challenges of life. But I do think, because if you looked in the media, and I've been in the media for the last two or three years, and what you could and couldn't say, and how things, how people would be cancelled if they had this point of view, and how this subject matter couldn't be addressed, and how people couldn't speak plainly about this. And I think it's recentering again. We talk about sport with male sport, and we always, we, we say, oh, the boys this, the boys that. I did, I did an article sort of six years ago, and I just said, oh, I thought the girls are brilliant today. Uh, it was when it was actually in the women's World Cup, but they did they didn't want the word girls being used. You mm -hmm. know, it didn't fit in with. You know, it wasn't sort of appropriate. I'm kind of like, wow, we, we still we still talk about boys. You know, I thought the boys were brilliant. So, you know, in, in press conference and stuff, but that kind of went. You know, have we just gone too far in some mm -hmm. of these things? And I'd love to see it come back where we just get a balance again about. Just yeah. common sense, isn't it? <laughs> some of the stuff that's out there and some of the things that you can say and and can't say, some of it is, I can't think of a better word, some of it's absolute bullshit, it's unnecessary. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's a tough world. Talking about challenges and talking about overcoming things, you've lost 10% of your squad now through injuries and you've lost your captain. How challenging is that for you? Oh, I don't think it is challenging at all. I think it's exciting. Tell me why. Is that an Antipodean mentality? Yeah. Half it, half full glass? Oh, I just think that um, there's, there's a change in the squad. We had a group of players that were coming towards the end. You know, they, were, they had been great players for us. What, Alan Wynne-Jones? Alan Wynne-Jones. Yeah. Um, but there was Ken Owens. Justin uh, Tiberi. Yeah, Justin Tiberi. Yeah, they're sort of, sort of mid-30s and, you know, even a bit older than that. Um, whether we would have got through next year or not. So... Um, whether they would have got through to the World Cup, but I, I, we've got a group of youngsters that have come through, and they're, they're training the house down. They've brought a different dynamic, a different amount of energy. So I, I'm I'm never someone who looks back. I never someone who, oh, if it, I wish he wasn't injured, or I wish he didn't give up. 
I just wish he didn't just deal with the hand that's been dealt, right? And move on. Yeah. You have to do that at this level. You have to do that in sports. So let other people worry about those things. Let other people talk about those things. I, I, I can't afford to waste energy and time about things that I can't change. Absolutely. You get a very early taste of coaching, don't you? At 26 with Galawegians. How did that come about? And how did that fit into the phase of your career? 26 years of age to be starting to look at coaching is quite young, isn't it? Yeah, I think I was always destined to be a coach. I was, uh, I'd captain a lot of teams, often c coaches that, that coached me, you know, would ask, ask my opinion or advice about things. So, yeah, that was sort of towards the end of a an all black uh, tour. Um, Galwegians were looking for a player coach. So I said I was 26. Mm. Uh, I was teaching back in New Zealand at the time and said, yeah, it'd be great, great life experience. So resigned. Have boots will travel. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Resigned my teaching job. You know, people uh, in Ireland couldn't believe that I resigned uh, my job to go, you know, for five or six months there. Because I think at that time, I think unemployment in Ireland was about 20% mm. and interest rates about 20%. But that's kind of, I suppose, the Kiwi way, really, you know, just... Mm an adventure have a go. Yeah, yeah have a go and so yeah i did that uh for four years going backwards and forwards the only downside was eight winters in a row but uh mm. um yeah it kind of really got me on 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 the coaching the coaching journey and i suppose the the the, the, the teacher training that i'd had kind of in the right. organization the structure and things and then how did i apply some of the things that i wanted to do did you have any chance i mean because it, it strikes me um, and I, again, I, I can't help it, Warren. I, I equate a lot of sports to football and not always in the most positive way. And by that, I mean, it strikes me in, in rugby that it's a culture that's steeped in respect, whether it's between the players themselves or whether it's recogni recognition of authority. But the translation and the, the respect that's needed to be a coach at 26 years of age, were you qu quickly able to get that? from your charges and the people that you well, were working with i think the fact that i was an all black i probably had a yeah had, had got a, some cash yeah, yeah 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 and that's kind of you got got a little bit of uh you got a little bit of credit in the bank to, to start with and for me as a as a but you know as well as i do that that credit as soon as you open yeah. your mouth and say something that's bloody stupid the players <laughs> will be looking at it absolutely from a different perspective. Yeah, yeah definitely yeah and, and i always promised myself um and always did as a coach that i would never coach the things that i didn't like as a player you know so uh, i didn't such as such as i didn't mind training hard right all right and that's a prerequisite though isn't yeah, it? yeah 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 but i hated long training sessions right you know i i uh if training sessions went on for too long and they lost the intensity right i got bored so do a brilliant 90 minutes rather than a, 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 a an average two hours. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Or well, 60 minutes rather yes. than an yeah. hour and a half. You yeah. know, kind of, uh, if I know, and I kind of went through the, the game had gone and I was lucky enough to have a couple of good coaches that, um, probably at that time board and, uh, organization and structure and planning to session. So I'd, and, and that's my teaching background. You know, I'd plan a session and say, right, boys, this is what we're doing today. We're going to go for, um, 60 minutes or 70 minutes we're going to be doing this 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 drill and pretty much keep to times so they knew exactly what they're doing this is the intensity we're looking for i wanted to make it enjoyable i wanted to make it fun and i wanted them you know the amateur i wanted them to come back and in those times uh, that was that was the biggest challenge but was it an easy transition for you surprisingly it was yeah. well it probably helped with the <laughs> the first one i went to gorwich and i think we won our first 13 games in a row so that kind of uh, that helps. Yeah, yeah. That bet you were yeah. nice and easy. And, yeah, and um, the first night, the first day I arrived there, I said to the manager, you know, how many, how many people are you expecting at training? He said, oh, about thirty. I said, oh, okay. So, the thing that happened it was probably the best thing for me and for them as well is that on the Saturday we had a game. I couldn't play the first couple of games, so on the Saturday I said, uh, right, we'll meet at um, Hubbard's ten, and the bus leaves uh, the club rooms at eleven o'clock, and we had a I think about an hour and a half to go to a place called Sligo on the bus. At half past ten, when the meeting was supposed to, when we were supposed to be there to meet, uh, there was me and four other players. Right. At eleven o'clock, uh, there was thirteen of us, and I went, "Right, bugger this! I'm a Kiwi. 
we we're on the bus. I said, we, we haven't got any running. I said, I don't care. Look at what we got, yeah. Just get on the bus yeah. and go. And so a few players arrived a little bit later and um, they, they got in their cars and picked up a, a couple of stragglers and they ended up turning up. And But when I got there, I got, got in front of the bus. I said, I've just come from an All Black tour. I know the game's amateur. Yeah. But if I go back to New Zealand and say we had a team meeting at Hub Bus 10. you turn up, yeah. And 11 o'clock the bus was going. We drove out the bus out at the gate for 13 players. That'd be a laughing stop. Yeah. So either I get on the plane tomorrow and uh, go back or we decide to take yeah. this seriously. Yeah. And I'm not talking about stupid serious. So, and so find all the players that were late. What was the reaction? When, you know, obviously, because if, they, if, they're, if they're coming, if you're saying turn up at 10.30 and they didn't, it's obviously because they felt they didn't have to, right? Well, I think this is the way they always did things, yeah. and they had, didn't have any. So, what was their reaction to this new sheriff well, in town? Yeah, uh, well, I know a few of the older players who were a lot older than me at the time, sort of late late twenties, early thirties, kind of looked at each other as sitting in the back of the bus and going, "Oh my God, we've got to write one yeah. here." It was kind of <laughs> they told me about that afterwards, um, and they've and they've actually become great mates of mine, and and things, and some of the stories that we we tell and stuff. Um, but yeah, they bought into it, understood, because we're all on the same page. You know, everyone everyone understood what the boundaries were. If you understand what the boundaries are, then you go a long way to to making sure that you don't have to deal with any issues. It's it's, it's black and white. There's no well, there's I no gray. Fair, you know? If you're fair and consistent with people, they know where they stand. If you've got the courage, your convictions, you deal with people properly, and you say what you mean and mean what you say. There'll be some people that won't follow it. And there'll be some people that you you don't want to follow it because they're not worth your time anyway. Yeah. But I think if you're clear in life, I think most people can be and, – and in sports, I think that's very specific because I think if you want winners, you've got to be able to tell them good and bad, right? Yeah, and sometimes, you, sometimes you've got to follow through with some of the things that you, you say. I yeah. remember 2011, uh, we put a curfew on being back at the hotel at 1 o'clock. So we had night games – Hub bus seven, game would finish at hub bus nine. We'd be, we wouldn't get back to the hotel until about 11 o'clock and we'd say to the guys, look, if you want to go for a drink, you're there, but you're back in the hotel by Who's one. Who's that, with the Welsh National with team? With the Welsh yeah. team, yeah. I don't care who you are. If you're out, even if you're drinking water or orange juice, if you're out to three o'clock or four o'clock in the morning. You're not going to be fit for purpose. And it, and it doesn't look right. Yeah. Okay. And we said, look. If you come back at one o'clock and the bar's still open, you can have a beer, yeah. but I want you back there. And I said, if you're not back by one o'clock, then keep walking to the airport because that's where you're going to be yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. And and the reaction to that was? They were all back by one yeah. o'clock, yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, that, and you know, thankfully I didn't have to, you know, do that. But yeah. but some, at some sometimes you've, you've got, got to, to be prepared to do it. Yeah. You can't say something to somebody and then not do it because no. the moment you do that, you're done, right? Yeah, and you lose you lose respect. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think they've seen me in the past that been have been prepared to make tough calls and tough decisions and stand by them. You know, and um, probably probably the biggest thing for me, and and people to, often you get coaches they 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 talk the talk but they don't walk the walk. Mm -hmm. And for me, one thing that I'd that I always say to all our players whenever they come in. Uh, about how privileged and how lucky we are to be involved in professional sport and to do what we do. But the most important thing, the thing that's more important than rugby is your family. Mm -hmm. And whatever issues that you've got, got at home or if, you, if your partner's having a scan or someone's sick or a death in the family, whatever, your dog's sick, you know, um, come and see us and we can we can help support mm -hmm. things. You know, even, if, even if there's issues and relationship issues, and because for me, by giving what seems to them a lot, by me giving a little, I get so much more. Is that because you believe in that principle or is it, or is it because you know the value of what they what it means to them? A bit of both. Yeah. Yeah, a bit of both. I, I, I had the experience in Galway. I, I, I didn't realise until recently um, our first daughter, Shauna, was, um, she was born in Galway and we didn't know at the time we had scans and stuff. She was born with spina bifida. Right. And they'd spent a lot of money as a club and we were going through some playoffs and, and promotion playoffs. And um, and that, and those playoffs were coming up. And so she was in the hospital and members of the club came to me and said, oh, you got to go home. 
And my first reaction was, um, yeah, we've got these playoffs coming up and they went, no, your family's more important. Mm. So we t went home and we got a settled and stuff. And about three weeks later, I rang the club up and said, do you want me to come back in the playoffs? And they said, would you do that? And I said, yeah, I would. And it wasn't until I realized what they had done for me yeah. that I wanted to give it back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and so I came back, um, was three ga three playoff games we had to play. I played in the first two, he won them. I didn't have to play in the last one and flew back, back to New Zealand. And so um, I said, like, if things are right at home with the players and- It's their base, isn't it? Yeah, and their it's partners their base, are happy and the, yeah. they feel that they're being looked after then I get a much better product, product at training and mm. I get a better performance uh, in the weekends as well. Where does being the head coach of the British and Irish Lions rank in terms of personal achievements for you? Oh, it's uh, it was an unbelievable honour, you know. Um, yeah. You know, it's something that I'm really proud of. I'm really proud of that involvement. Obviously, the lo a lot of time that I'd spend in the Northern Hemisphere, the time we'd lived in Ireland and living in london and then the years we spent in wales so to have that opportunity to to coach you know the players from four nations and to bring them again i, I my first tour was in, in 2009 where i went as an assistant coach and and then i never took that for granted i think it's it's something i feel passionate about that it's the one team that still has the traditional ethos and values that goes and plays and tours that used to happen during the amateur days and um and i think we need to do whatever we can to keep promoting it and, and keep protecting it because it's, it's unique and um you know i'm just you know really grateful and, and really you know thank you for the opportunities i had to be involved with that team how have you squared the circle between because there's been times when you stepped out of the welsh job haven't you and gone into the british lines yes and then come back in the autumn internationals yeah <laughs> My first reaction to that was, if I was the Welsh rugby board, I'd be like, well, how does that fucking suit me? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Um, I tell you what, it was good for me because yeah. I was in Wales for 12 years initially, and that's a long time to be in that. So the, 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 the Lions thing was good for me mentally. Yeah, It was good for me to go step back, do something, get re-energised, work with other coaches and other players and see what's going on and that and then come back re refreshed i think that was that's kind of the, the approach that yeah. i had it i it was and in a fairness of welsh i mean they're incredibly supportive for me to be able to do that and then i guess if you win four six nations yeah the backstory's there isn't it yeah, yeah. but then I, if we hadn't have done that then i wouldn't have been the lions coach yeah, yeah. so it's kind of like a and then I had some some fantastic coaches to work with, and then there was an opportunity for them for their development and their opportunity to, to when we were away with the Lions, then then Wales were involved in other games, and for, it was a chance for them to step up mm -hmm. and 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 develop their skills absolutely and be mm -hmm. part of their development. Yeah, so, um, succession management, I suspect, yeah. in some respects. Isn't yes, it? absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I can see where you're coming from, but yeah, just it's I sort of thought saucy sod. How does he get to do that? <laughs> I, if I'm the Welsh rugby board, I'd be like, well, I want you here. Yeah. Doing this job and building up my team. But Yeah, but then you think about it and go, How good it is how good is it for Wales where you know the smallest tier one nation in the world with the smallest population, with the mm. with the least resources. We know we, we don't have got his head coach captain of British Lions. Yeah. yeah. Mm. You know, we don't have major industries. We don't yeah. even have our own bank in Wales. Mm. And look at the success we've had, then we've mm. got British and Irish Lions coach, we should be celebrating that. You know, you don't, you don't want to 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 hold that back. And um, so the support I had from from them, from the board in the past, has been absolutely fantastic. Which well, obviously a relationship works because here you are back there again. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that in a minute. If yeah, that, whether that was your greatest decision or wisest <laughs> one. Um, it leads me into your relationship with Eddie Jones. Yep, big characters, rivals. Is rivalry in the dugout important in sport? I think, I think a lot of it's about, a lot of it's created by the media, yeah, and a lot it is, of yeah. it is kind of like, uh, you know, I haven't been, I've haven't been adverse in the past to throw a few grenades in every now and again, and sometimes that's to take pressure off the players, and I'm quite happy for, you know, that mm, pressure to make you the centre of attention. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like, have we been rivals? Yeah. 
Eddie and I have been out for, you know, drinks together and, um, and meals in the past and, and I enjoy his company, yeah. you know, I don't always agree with everything he says and he does, but that's, that's sports, you know, how do you sort of separate the two and things, you know, we have, uh, I can remember going to Six Nations launches and you, you're going up to do a bit of a press conference and like, go on, go on, Eddie, get in there, throw a couple of grenades in there and make it a little bit easier for me. Um, because you've traded barbs, haven't you? Yeah, we have traded. Um, yeah. and, and I mean, some of the comments are quite funny. I mean, you know, you know, send my best wishes to Warren and make sure he enjoys the third and fourth playoff and comments like that. And obviously, there's a few things that you've said coming back to him on observations. Has it ever gotten, well, that, has it ever gotten to the point where it's personal? No, I don't and he's think. He's got on your bloody nerves. Or, no, what I was what I was asked about that, and uh, that was after the World Cup, be you know, before the World yep. Cup final. Yeah, and. I thought that England in the semi-final against the All Blacks were amazing. I just thought they were brilliant. You know, when Eddie made that comment, I wasn't being critical. I was kind of saying sometimes teams play their finals before they actually play the final and just being aware of that. It was giving them, I was actually giving them a bit of advice. Yeah. So, a bit strong. You called England bottle jobs, though, wasn't it? What's that? that? You called England bottle jobs. Did I say that? Mm. that? That must have been something the press said. It's not a word I would ever use. This, yeah. is, this is what you said. So I've drawn the inference of bottle jobs, but this is this is what you've said. I look back on England in the last few years when it's really mattered. I've questioned whether they can win these big games. Yeah, which is basically your bottle jobs. <laughs> it's an interesting comment for one manager to make about. It's something very alien, and it's that's why I'm interested to see where that comes from and what the motivation was for saying it. Because you just beat them, and it's like I've beat you, and yeah. now I'm going to take a piss on you. Yeah, well, kind of, uh, yeah, it might have been. I think that in a game where sometimes you, you're questioning, like you said, their mental toughness mm. or something like that, if that has a s small percentage of Gets some... in their ribs. Or some people believing in that. Yeah. I, I remember, I, I tell you really, I tell you, same thing. Uh, it was that year, actually, 2019. Because our first two games were away... Uh, to France and Paris, and then the next game was um, Italy and Rome. And I went to a rugby writer's dinner, and they said to me, would you do a Q&A? And um, so I went on the Q&A, and they said, how do you think you're doing the Six Nations? And I, I, I honestly believe this. I said, if we beat France in the first game, I didn't say win the Grand Slam, if we beat France in the game, I think we'll win the, yeah. the Six Nations. I, I believe that. And, but I was thinking, if my players see that as a, as a quote, and the coach is saying that, and that has a little bit of a positive impact on that. That that's kind of what I was. Job was, done. Yeah, yeah, job done. Yeah. Now, an hour later, uh, Johnny Sexton gets awarded. Comes up for an award. He got World Rugby Player of the Year. Uh, he gets. Um, yeah, they do an interview. So, oh, how do you think um, Ireland will go in the Six Nations? And Johnny said, "Oh, I was a waste of time talking about the Six Nations. Gats has already said Wales are going to win." And I'm sitting at my seat going, "Oh my God!" Yeah. How that's been spun out? Yeah, but I've done a job on him. You know, if he, if in some small way, right? Okay. If some yeah. small way, he's thinking that he's bought into that. Yeah, he's bought into that. Yeah. And we played them in the last game of the Six Nations. He didn't have a great game, and um, you know, we beat Ireland and, and win the Grand Slam. And kind of thinking, so you know, sometimes it's it, it is little wee mind games. You do get caught up with the press a little bit because. They paraphrase. They do. <laughs> so when some bullshit somebody, elaborate, yeah, embellish, embroider, yeah, downright so, lie. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes it might be something in the uh, press conference where Eddie would have been asked a question, and myself gets asked. They paraphrase, and when they say Eddie said such and such, and you go, "Oh, hang on a minute," boom, bite, and you get yeah, yeah, and you get pissed off. Yeah. Then when you read the comment afterwards, you go, oh. That's not quite what he said. No, not exactly. Quite what he meant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's. You looking forward to seeing him in a World Cup? Yeah, no, yeah. well, yeah, no, we've had some um, some battles, some great battles over mm. the years. Uh, look, he's, I think we when he's gone into different environments, uh, he's always had a, a quite a significant yeah, impact. Um, you know, hasn't always stayed uh, in places a long time because I think he's so demanding. Yeah. He can be, um, you know, want the best out of people, but but I think when that you know starts to to not be could be yeah. successful it can there's a balance there's a timeline isn't there yeah yeah and sometimes yeah. you know you're just pushing people so hard yeah. and, and you burn them out yeah. yeah and um 
but you know, I think at international rugby. Um, what did you make of his comments last year about private schools and rugby, particularly in England? I I think he had a point. And he was vilified for it, and they hung him out to dry, and they used it as an excuse, I think, to get rid of him and and build that narrative up that was already there in the first place. What was your take on it? Um, I, I, look, I could see what he was what he was saying in terms of that. Uh, I, I looked at it a different way. When you when you get a private schoolboy playing rugby who's playing the game for the love of the game, not for the money. Yeah, they are gold. Right. Absolutely gold. And I'll give you a Fraser Waters. Um, Family lived in Jersey, went to Harrow, whatever, came out. You couldn't find a tougher, more competitive player. And those are the sort of players I want, you know, that, uh, you know, how do you, how do you breed them? How do you create mm. them? That Because he's not, he's not playing professional rugby because money is earning. He's, he's doing it because he wants to. He wants to, and he yeah. wants to be a winner. That, yeah. it, that's, that was my experience yeah. of um, guys coming out of, from, uh, you know, he's probably had, more experience in that to be able to make that comment, but wasn't wasn't what I had had seen from my time living in in London and the experience. That I, I think the point he was making, and the reason why I concur with it, was the ability to be able to overcome adversity and to think yourself away through problems. If you've got a life of relative privilege, yeah, then solutions are often provided for you. But there's also the other side of the argument, which he was talking about in relatability to English players, was the inability to solve problems at key moments, and that comes from a background of not having had to have done it. Yeah. To some extent. Yeah. Talking about challenges, I mean, is a double edged sword for you. You Wales and the World Cup. I mean, your first spell against your current spell is a little bit like night and day, isn't it? Is it proving the old adage that you should never go back? Um some people have said that, but, I, but I'm not afraid of that. I kind of people a lot of people said, oh, are you worried that you were going to tarnish what you what achieved, you achieved in yeah. your reputation? I, I don't care about that. It's not. So, so what? What made you go back? They asked. They asked. Uh, I put so much into probably heart and soul and, and the people and the fans and, and everything. And I just thought, you know, there's an opportunity there. Because there's a lot going on, isn't there? there I mean, you've, there got had... television, you've got television documentaries talking about toxic cultures. You've got stupidity. I'm sorry, I think it's stupidity about songs being banned because of choruses in it. You've got players threatening to strike. I mean, you, you yourself have said, you know, I had no idea. I didn't realise a lot of these things were going to go on. And the challenge is, is this is this because you, you love this mentality, don't you, against all odds? Is this... That's what drives me. This drives you. Is this the ultimate embodiment here with yeah. all the background noise and all the background travails that are not just about producing a winning rugby team, it's about holding the bleeding thing together, lock, stock and barrel? Oh, is this the ultimate against that, all odds? That's a bit of both. I, I get a buzz out of... Uh, Overcoming I'm, adversity, oh, proving I, uh, people wrong. Yeah, that that drives me yeah. even... even I, I'm driven, but kind of... Uh, am I driven a little bit more at the moment? Yeah, I might not say too much of that publicly, but we're working our butts off at the yeah. moment. There's no expectation. Have we been pr proud of what we've achieved in the past? Yeah, we have. Have we overachieved as a, as a nation? Yes, we have. Uh, and and so, is rugby important to Wales? Yeah, it certainly is. So, Steeped in their history. Yeah. I mean, it's part and yeah. parcel of it. But we're still, we're, we're incredibly still critical of ourselves and, you know, and sort of don't always... I, you know, there's a there's a lot of negativity there, at times that that I, that frustrates me. When you coach international sport, or particularly, and the football managers will tell you exactly the same thing: is that the greatest thing about uh, the World Cup and the preparation? It feels the first time like you're back at a club side, like you're doing pre-season. The 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 in-depth stuff and the detail that you can do, and that sort of two or three months that you're together building for the World Cup, and that's what that, that's what. Um, I'm excited about it at the moment, but when you go into a Six Nations campaign, you got the players that come in for two weeks, and so you got to, you've just got to prioritise in terms of what are the things that are important that we've got to get ourselves ready in such a such a short term. So, to me, coming back in a World Cup year was um, probably was probably um, the biggest reason, the biggest decision that. I said yes to, to doing because I, I felt like I could make a real difference here right. in that period. You set targets in your mind beforehand. Yeah. You do? I set realistic targets. Yeah. And then... To whom? To them or to yourself? To both. Right. So what's our target? Our target's 
you have our group mate yeah, group yeah make yeah. quarter finals yeah i've been involved with teams that you know, it's before the other team, you know, you get a psychologist come in and you get sitting there and you've got a group of players and saying, this is what we're going to do, we're going to win this, we're going to win that, and, you know, win a World Cup. And I'm going, oh, my God, I don't even believe that. <laughs> do you believe in sports psychology? <laughs> uh, done in the right way. Yeah. Um, I think it can be powerful and giving clear, distinct messages, for people learning from those things, but... I also think with psychology as well is that I don't want players to have to use psychology or have it as a crux where they're relying on it. It's kind of like, yeah, sometimes you go through some issues where they might want to build some confidence to talk to mm -hmm. someone, but then how do you, they're making sure that person says, my job now is to, to wean them off me and, and always be available. But I, I, I've in seen- the end, they've got to do it, haven't they? Yeah, and I've seen sometimes where it's all, I've always, I've sometimes felt that a mental skills person or psychologist is there almost being uh that, like i said that crux for that person where they're always there always there and, and i'm not sure that when I, what i've seen is that relationships always been 100 percent healthy for mm. the player or or for the team now you took wells to the world cup semi-final in 2019 this time round, what constitutes success for you We've got to get past. We're in a good side of the draw, so we get to the quarterfinals, and that we've got a good chance to to go to go a long way. And the thing with the Welsh boys is that for them, they build on momentum, they build on yep. confidence, and they start they start really believing. And there's a great there's a great, um, and I haven't shown the players this year. The, after the World Cup in 2019, we played in South Africa in the semi final, and Razi Erasmus, you know, he gets up and says. These boys are tough. You know, they're not going away. They won't give up. They're not soft like England and Ireland and Scotland. You know, they're tough. Mm. They just don't, they don't know when to give up. And it's a video I've got to show our guys again. That's where I, I, I you know, when, when I see them, I'm pretty proud of. Yeah, that's right. I was going to say that's an embodiment of you, isn't it? Yeah, yeah what yeah, people yeah. thought about us. And we probably, that slipped a little bit. And we need to get back to what people think about us. And, um, so for me, yeah. So there's no guarantees, but you know, is it fine margins in these sort of tournaments? Absolutely. So if I go back to 2011, where we should have made the World Cup final, where Sam Orbiton sent off in the, in the semi-final against France, and we lose the game nine eight. Uh, we lose the opening game of that tournament to South Africa sixteen fifteen, and and I'm still convinced a penalty goal went over that was disallowed by. Uh, the touch judge, and then we're playing uh, two games later. We're playing Samoa, who are, which are a really good team, and we're down at half time. If we lose that game, we're out of the World Cup, and yet we go on to probably, you know, make could have made the final. Maybe, maybe if we made the final, you never know what would have happened. But I go down to, to the change room at half time, and Sam Warburton has the players in a huddle, and he just said, "I said, come on there," and he's there, and he goes, "We're not going home." We haven't gone through this pain. We haven't gone through the hard work that we've put into this uh, tournament. We are not going home. He said, look, Samula, we are not going home. And I said back, went, well, I don't need to say anything. That'll yet. do, yeah. 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 It's a bit like Martin Johnson lining up at Croke Park, isn't yeah. it? The wrong way and not moving for the Irish. Yeah. That'll do. Yeah. Yeah, That'll exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we we'll out and we've gone out and played well in the second half and, you know, have won that and, and, and the coach through. gets all the credit yeah exactly i don't yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely yeah I, I was i was brilliant at half time yeah, yeah what did you say at half time you must have been amazing yeah I, oh yeah 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 I, just, I said bugger all i didn't need to say anything <laughs> yeah. well because you set it up already and yeah. if you've got players if you've got players in your side that have got that attitude then that's a reflection of the correct of the culture you created in the first place isn't it? it's yeah. a reflection of them but it's also a reflection of the environment. Yeah, hopefully. And then try how do you create that self belief and how do you create that that will and want and um, that's kind of been my thing with with the Welsh boys in the past that, that they've never they've never shied away from the hard work and we've said I you know I often say if you ask them to run through a brick wall they the the question would be All right, what do you want us to yeah. do when we get to yeah, the other the side, side yeah. not not why yeah, yeah. yeah. and. And, um, so you can work with that though, can't you? Oh, you can work with that. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But you've got to, but they've got to believe in you. Yeah. You've got to, how do you got to create that? And you've got to create that belief in you and your staff and people around the environment that you create. 
if you're able to to do that, then I think you could, all of you can go on a journey that sort of can, you know, hopefully do something that's special, create that's something. That's, to it, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, we're going to have our ups and downs because so we're not the biggest playing nation in the world, and we're going to get retirements and players and injuries, and that doesn't that doesn't always help. But to me, it's not about winning. So I'm, going to, I'm trying to change a bit of the narrative of this group at, at the moment because they've been under a bit of pressure. And sometimes you go into press conferences and there's a question, oh, is this a must-win game? Do you have to win this game? And I go, well, yeah, sometimes it has been. But for me at the moment is I'm, I don't, I'm not going to focus on winning. What, what I want us to do is and, and to create some of the things I spoke about, mental toughness. I want us to become a really tough team to beat. Yeah, and then you'll win. Yeah. yeah. To get the fundamentals. Yeah, if you become yeah. really hard to beat and you start working for each the other. The rest will take you. care of itself. Yeah. 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 You, yeah. Hey, have you thought about coaching some rugby? You might be actually quite good. <laughs> I don't know, mate. <laughs> um, it's easier to say. It's more difficult yeah. to do it. <laughs> yeah, so just those sorts of um, – if we can get, if we can get uh, a lot of those fundamentals right in terms of um, on the, uh, within the team, we'll do okay. Talking about, I mean, uh, the overall culture, moving on from the World Cup, moving on from Wales, um, to looking at the overall culture and some of the things that rugby does differently than other sports. Um, I think this is true, but I, I'm keen to hear what you think um, or whether you think it's the obligation of rugby to have this sort of moniker. It's held up as the bastion of respect in sport. Do you think that's right? I watch the footballers and I watch the, the current culture of referees being put behind the eight ball all the time, the lack of respect that seems to be in place, yet rugby doesn't seem to have that challenge at all. I reckon you can fix it in football in... How? Three months. How? Yellow card, red card, lose the game. Yellow card, red card for language, for intimidation. Do you know why they won't do that? I don't know why, but broadcast, I'll tell you. What? I reckon it's broadcasters. I, I reckon what, it's I, compromising match quality, losing, I'll losing the quality. You, I'll tell you what, if you're a coach and your players are question the referee, language, whatever. But the bloody coaches are worse now. Yeah, well, then get rid of them as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you want to fix a game, and if you see you see that that's the same thing happens in rugby, all of a sudden uh, they, there's a rule change or you know, there and a player gets yellow carded or penalised on a regular basis. The coach says, "If you don't, if you don't, if you don't cut that, or you don't stop it. You won't be selected, and you'll yeah. be off." And within a very short period, the 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 attitude or the or what doesn't matter your team, whatever team's doing, it changes so quickly because it's all about performance and result. And if you don't change it, if you don't change your, your ways, or is it also to do with finances as well, though? Because when you're in a situation with football where there's so much money. And it, you know, I mean, you rugby boys must look across there sometimes, and yeah. and look at the football players rolling around on the pitch. Look at all the histrionics that go on, and go, Jesus Christ, what's that all about? But the overriding aspect of being able to change something, because I'm with you. I'm like, if you want to change something, damn well change it, and have the courage of your convictions to do it, and do whatever it takes to do it. And if that means people have to be given a yellow card every time they open their trap, right, to a referee, give it to them, and pretty soon. People's minds will be concentrated because when they when teams are losing, games are being um, lost as a result of it. And Players you, are getting banned. People are getting fined. And if fans getting, are getting pissed off. And if you're getting relegated, then your wages are yeah. going down. It always says it has an impact. Yeah, I, 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 like I said, it, it, it's an easy fix for me. It's a, the, the biggest question I, I'd, love, I'd love to see in football where a, a, a stadium said we're not going to segregate our fans because we don't do it in rugby. And I, I tell you, it's all the bravado. If, if I was behind a fence and want to see Ray, this man would get really. I don't know. I think that's. I think that's an ant antipodean outlook. I'm not sure. You don't in think the, so? Yeah, no, mate. I'm, I listen. I'm all, <laughs> I'm, I, I mean, I've sat in rugby stadiums and I really enjoyed the fact that you can integrate with the opposition without all the bullshit that goes on in football. But it's also something unique about the reasons why football is what it is, and that is the tribalism. And I think we'd be asking for blue murder if you start mixing fans in football stadiums. Could you not I have? Think, could you not have parts of the the the, the stands that were integrated? So, what are you going all woke on us here? <laughs> You've gone woke there, mate. You've been in the studio for too long. You've gone all woke. Last question. Yep. How much are you relishing the challenge of the World Cup for you as an individual? Uh well, yeah, I'm a little bit apprehensive, nervous. But that's good, so, though, isn't it? Excitedly good, nervous. Yeah. yeah. Um, I said there's there's the expectation isn't external; it's only internal. 
right. and what we think that we can do and good uh, for you yeah. yeah so um i i am really looking forward to it um got my family all coming over it's cost me a fortune with uh you know flying them all out and paying for everything but moments you know, in time oh, isn't it moments in know, time. I, I wouldn't have it any other way and so um yeah that's 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 special for me and i always want to I, I, my wife is unbelievable in terms of the way she can brings um all the the partners wives and the management wives and bring them together. and she keeps with them whatsapp groups and the, she she knows all their names and their kids names mm. and stuff and when you got some you know for me someone like that brings unity doesn't it yeah it does yeah. and it's kind of like you know introduced yesterday i said i said a few words to them and said the boss wants to say something now so um <laughs> you know but she's a little five foot two redhead she's she's wonderful she's the only thing i'm scared of is a little five foot two redhead but uh i think we make a good team and um you know it's about creating environments that with a chance of doing something yeah. special well, good luck, mate. Thank you. I totally well. enjoyed it today. Thank Thanks you for being upfront with me. Yeah, no problem at all. Cheers. Upfront with me, Simon Jordan, is brought to you by William Hill. Future episodes can be found on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. 18 plus, please gamble responsibly.